I'm so glad to see all of you here. Uh, my name is Terry Wise. I'm uh, one of a number of people on the Justice Task Force. And um, we are so pleased that Josh Hall has agreed to um, give us a little history lesson about our congregation in the earliest days and our interactions with the Mohican people, which is ongoing, but I would say being revived at this point. Um, and we're very hopeful about that. And um, I think, I believe that Josh has been a member of this church longer than I have. I'm quite sure he was already here when I joined in the early 80s. And uh, <laughs> um, he is a student of history and um, teaches at the Lee High School and also um, works at the um, Stockbridge Archives at the library. So um, he's been tracking our, our history here at this church for a long time and has a lot to teach us. So I'll turn it over to Josh Hall. Thank you, Terry. Takwaniwan wera tons, or welcome, in the Mexican language. To begin with, I'd like to thank the Social Justice Task Force for allowing me the opportunity to talk today. Uh, I will begin by saying that I am a student. I am not an expert. I have a great deal to learn, and I love learning about not only uh, the church, the town of Stockbridge, the history of the indigenous people. So uh, know that there may be errors in what I say. Uh, hopefully, there are nothing too egregious. Um, and if you have other information that you, you feel that I should uh, add or whatever, by all means, please let me know. Uh, I know that our time here is, is limited to about an hour, so I will, I will try to keep that in mind. Uh, at some point, if we're getting too close, somebody just you know, raise your hands and say, <laughs> shut it, and I will try to stop. So this particular topic is uh, a very important topic and a very complicated topic to, to kind of understand and there's no way uh, one could spend months going over all of the information pertaining to what is happening here in Stockbridge uh, or its, its predecessor names, uh, the relationship within the tribe, never mind then its later interaction with European settlers and then going forward. So what I will try to go over today is, is somewhat condensed. Uh, and at the end, I have a, a couple of resources that if you're interested in more information, um, more than happy to share that and, and um, give other uh, going forward. So one of the first things that I think we need to do, despite the description of what it looks outside earlier by Brent, we're going we're gonna to take that out of our minds and we're, we're going to think about being in this spot but not in the building, the building does not exist. And that looking around us, we see a very nicely covered forest floor. There aren't a lot of extra uh, vegetation, but there are, are innumerable trees. It is a, a veritable forest everywhere that we see. And to our left, if we're standing where we are, we see what would be called the Great Meadow, an open area that goes along the Housatonic River. We would see the mountains either in front of us or behind us, depending on which way you're standing. And it would be a very calming uh, situation, something that would be very different than what we have today. There would be along the river uh, tri tribal dwellings. Some of those dwellings would be single family uh, uh, dwellings. Others would be long houses, which would have multi-generations, multi-families, uh, possibly with, uh, maybe it's a little bit cooler because we're in March, so there would still be that ongoing fire and the smoke coming out through the, the central opening in those, uh, in those dwellings. People would be going about their business what we know is Main Street today still would have been what was known as the Plain Road. There was a primary road or pathway that went along what is Main Street. And then if you know your, your street layout in Stockbridge, what we know as Elm Street today would have been a forest path heading south 
towards Great Barrington. And that would have been the local community, roughly somewhere between five and 700 people in this particular area in, in what would be called Stockbridge. And throughout Berkshire County, looking at a population between 40 and 50,000 people, which is not, uh, historically speaking, that's not uh, exactly how many people we envision being here in terms of the native population, but at its, at its height, that would have been the, the majority of the people. So a very different look at what the town in its indigenous time period would have looked like. And then everything changes. 1609, you have Henry Hudson coming up, what will eventually be the river that is, is named for him. Uh, the indigenous name for that river would have been the Mihikinatuk, which simply means the ever-flowing waters, which is one of the reasons why the indigenous name for the people in this area is the Mehikanuk, because they are the people of the ever-flowing waters, uh, the, that particular tribe being referred to as a river tribe. And it would be part of their culture, it would be part of their everyday life to use that water source for whatever it is that they would need, whether it is farming, whether it's for transportation, uh, and, and so on, it would have been really what defined who they were. Henry Hudson, that, that European exchange changes everything because now there is uh, a, growing, a growing European uh, position within that area that is going to be the Mohican land. The other thing that I think we need to keep in mind is that the Mohican territory is not just here, uh, but it, it extends all the way out to the area that has that, uh, the Hudson River area. So from the Hudson River uh, to the Housatonic River and beyond to uh, what is now Blandford, uh, Middlefield, Chester, that area, kind of sandwiched in between the mountains. The Mohican people are also a combination of, of various different groups. It's not just one particular group. We also see a, a, a combination of Algonquian, uh, Handawanasi, or Iroquois people, the Mohawk, Wappinger, uh, Housatonic, Pocumtuck, all of those various different tribal groups come together to create what we know as the Mihikinuk people. So as time progresses, you have two very different communities. You have the New York community, for lack of a better explanation, and then you have the Berkshire, the, the Mohicans in this area, in, in the Berkshire County. The Mohican in this area would have been in the Usiadinuk area or the land beyond the mountains, so to the other side of the mountains. And although we have two different populations, there is a combining of the two people. There, are, there would be in the Hudson River at Scaticoke Island, that is where the Great Council Fire would take place. So any major decisions that would need to take place, any discussions about affairs or movement, those would take place in that location whenever necessary. So it's a much wider community than we necessarily think of. But bringing it back here to, to this community, in southern Berkshire, there were two primary communities, Scatahook and Wanatook. Scatatook is in the Sheffield Great Barrington border area. And if you've ever been to Great Barrington and you've read any of the, uh, the various different plaques that are down there, uh, there is one that talks about the Great Long House and its existence. It would have been in that area further south uh, as you head towards the Great Barrington Sheffield border. Nohanatook would have been in this area. That would have been in the Stockbridge area. And along those lines, as it pertains to our history, we have two primary sachems. 
we have Sawanakinakik, and we have Ponawanahanawa. One we typically refer to as Umpachini, the other as Kankapak. So in this, the Scatahook community in the Great Barrington area is being overseen by Umpachini, and then the Wanatuk area would have been in this area overseen by Kankapak. And as we progress through the late part of the 1600s and into the early part of the 1700s, there is going to be that opportunity for a variety of different European interaction. Limited, but there will be interaction. And because of our location, as close as we are to New York State, it would have been primarily with the Dutch. In point of fact, in between the two communities, uh, between Skadahuk and Wanatuk, uh, there was a set of brothers, uh, Joachim and Abraham van Valkenburg, and they, in their relationship with the tribe, they maintained what they called a, a trunk house. And that trunk house would have been an area where they would have collected materials that they were bringing over from New York State, as well as uh, various different uh, items that the tribe would bring together. And it would be like a trading post that would have uh, taken place. Uh, the Van Valkenburgs also served a very important purpose uh, in that they were the primary interpreters when anybody from outside of this area would have come into uh, either the Skatahook or the Wahanatuk area. So they, even though we don't typically hear about them in terms of our, our overall church history, uh, they will serve a purpose as interpreters going forward. So there is, there is interaction, there is limited interaction, but it means that the outside world, the European world, is somewhat known, not fully, but it is, it is in that area. And it's about 1725 that we have the first interaction between tribal members and English settlers in the southern area of Berkshire County in what would eventually come uh, in 1733, the area of Sheffield. So that is the first permanent residency of, of Europeans besides the two Van Valkenburg brothers uh, who are going to be in this area. And that is going to kind of begin that, that phase of change that is going to, it's a, a domino effect of, of what's going on. And as individuals kind of start to move a little bit further north, as we in this area of the Wahanatuk area start to take a look at what's, what's happening, it's a clash of cultures. It's, it's two very different ideas coming together. And even though those two ideas coming together, um, is, it, is it purposeful, is it, is, it, is it a positive thing, is it a, a negative thing? It just, in that particular instance, we're looking at a number of different, uh, a number of different interactions. We're looking at the interaction of two different societies, we're looking at two different political views, two very different religious viewpoints, uh, and so on. So it's it's hard to really put a put a real point on what in the very early days of what was going on in terms of interaction between the two communities, the European community and the indigenous community, exactly what was happening. Over time, it um, it reveals itself in various different ways, though. So. With English families beginning to settle in this area, we're not talking about a large number of individuals in the early part of the 1700s. We're still talking double digits. We're talking maybe at the very most between 15 and 20 individuals. We're not talking about large families at this point or anything along those lines. 
So in terms of the beginning of our history, in terms of the church, and in terms of the Wahanatuk area, 1734 is the pivotal date. In 1734, John Belcher, who was the governor of Massachusetts at that time, the, the, the provincial governor, called Umpachini or Umpachen and Konkapot to Springfield. And there was a very distinct purpose as to why he was doing this. At that point, there had been two wars that started as European wars and found their way over to the colonial region at what we typically refer to as the French and Indian Wars. So you have most of that interaction happening up in the, the Canadian area by Quebec, uh, but it has kind of filtered down into this area. And so the raid on Deerfield that's going to take place uh, as that's taking place in the, the 16, late 1600s, you have this desire in the northern area of Massachusetts to have some type of a, a fort that's eventually going to be erected, Fort Massachusetts, which is now in what is today North Adams. Uh, that is supposed to be one of those key stopping points in order to prevent uh, another raid coming through. There is evidence, there is talk about some type of, of interaction coming through this particular area. So Belcher wanted to make sure, because this is the French and Indian War, so you have the, the French and their indigenous allies, and then you have the British and their indigenous allies, Belcher wanted to make sure that he had as many indigenous people on his side as he possibly could. So bringing Umpachini and Konkapot to Springfield in 1734 was for the express purpose of giving them military titles. So Umpachini was created a lieutenant and Konkapot was created a captain. And that, in doing so, was supposed to solidify the tribal uh, guarantee that they would be part of any type of uh, militia going forward in order to protect that particular area. It also meant that there was in some ways an acknowledgement that there were individuals in this extreme western area. You know, we, we joke about Boston not really having a, a, an idea of where we are. Uh, <laughs> So it's kind of nice, it, it ebbs and flows apparently, but in 1734 they knew that, uh, that there were indigenous people in this area and they wanted to make sure that before the French got to them that they were allied with, with the British. So that is the first interaction. And with that came the perfect opportunity for both of these sachems to be introduced to missionaries. And so it was at this same meeting that there was a discussion about would you be interested in having a missionary uh, come out to your area and talk about Christianity? And at that time, Upachini and Konkapot kind of deliberated and said, we'll let you know. We, we aren't going to make a commitment yet. And part of that was that it was not their decision. They needed to go back to the tribal members in both communities and have a discussion about how they wanted to deal with this, how they wanted to go forward. So true to their word, they returned to this area. And in July, the two communities met together and held a council where the, everybody had the opportunity to express their thoughts, their concerns, uh, any, anything that they wanted to. They were given the opportunity to, to talk on this issue, uh, whether they wanted to have a missionary come to this area or whether there were other things that they wanted to have brought out. And from, all, from everything that I have read, it was not an easy discussion. It was not a quick discussion. It was one that took a great deal of time because there is a great deal that you have to weigh in this. What is going to change? Do we need to change? Uh, 
is there, what are the benefits? Do the benefits outweigh the, the potential hazards of what is going to come with this interaction? Because, you know, are there problems? Or are we, are we kind of getting along with everything as it is in our two communities? And as I said, after an extended and extremely lengthy discussion, they decided that, yes, that it would not necessarily be a detriment to reach out and say, yes, we would be happy to take a missionary and listen to what he has to say, and we'll add a school teacher to that as well so that there's an educational part. So after that discussion, information will be sent back to Springfield and then will be delivered to Boston for the idea of having both a missionary, a minister come to this area to talk about Christianity to the tribal members and to have a teacher come out. So a few months later, because you know, there's no quick way to get information from one place to the other and gather everything, we're talking about going over trails that are you know, very small, uh, we, there's no super highway any place. We're, we're talking about walking, possibly um, maybe a little bit of a type of Pony Express situation, but they send their reply in July, and it's October when there will be the first arrival of the Reverend John Sargent. So October 1734 uh, is when John Sargent is going to arrive in... Uh, Wakanatuk, and he brings with him Timothy Woodbridge. Timothy Woodbridge will be acting as the teacher that will be here. And I'm sure that the Van Valkenburgs had the opportunity to kind of work with not only Umpachini and Konkapot, but also Timothy Woodbridge and John Sargent in what is supposed to be happening going forward, because John Sargent is in his early 20s as he comes out here. Um, he, is, he is very fresh, very green, uh, he's, uh, but he's extremely eager to move forward. He is a Yale graduate, uh, and, and he's looking to, to help with the expansion of Christianity and doing his part uh, in ministry. Woodbridge equally is looking at the opportunity for education uh, and seeing what that will look like as it unfolds with the tribe. So they come to this area, and I think sometimes, historically speaking, we have this idea that immediately houses are going to be popping up and streets are going to be paved and, and so on and so forth. I suppose one of the nice things in terms of the interaction between Woodbridge and Sargent and the, the tribal members is that that's not what happens. They're willing to work with the tribe. They don't immediately look for those European uh, comforts that they may be used to elsewhere. So as they are here in October, and think about what it's like in October, um, it still is, you know, they're willing to stay in a wigwam. They're not immediately saying, where's the wood? Where are the hammers and nails? How do we work with this? So they're beginning to, in some ways, understand or try to understand through interpretation, uh, through trial and error, what it's like to be in this area. It's isolated. You have two communities, as I said, but other than that, you have a long way to go before you get to the next major, organized, civilized, in a, in a European fashion, area. And then there's Sheffield. There's Sheffield. <laughs> With their arrival comes an understanding in European mind of what it's like to live in society, which is very different 
from the indigenous idea of living in society. The indigenous population in this area has sachems. Those sachems do not necessarily find their power in war exploits or in monetary value or anything along those lines. They find their power through the tribal women, elders, who at some point, either because of death or because there needs to be a change due to any number of circumstances, they come together and they select the next person who is supposed to be that leader. In many earlier uh, documents, it's not a, a sachem's name that you see marked or written on early land deeds. It is the elder women of the tribe who are making their mark on those deeds. That is not a concept that is very European. It is, it is a very different mindset. And yet that was something from what it seems that Woodbridge and Sargent are kind of working with, but that's not necessarily what they need to worry about at the moment. Um, they need to figure out how, what they're going to do. The other major thing that is going to become a, a piece in this whole story is ownership. This is mine. I brought this with me. This is mine because I'm standing in front of it. Okay. Land equals power. Land equals the right to vote. Land equals wealth is the European mindset. In England and in early colonial areas, you chart out, you cut up, you divide, and that is your possession. You've paid for that or you've acquired it however it may happen, that is yours. Versus a very different concept in terms of indigenous understanding that it's a communal piece. Just like any major change that's going to happen within the tribe, it is a community decision as to what happens. It is not an individual's decision. So going back to that whole beginning of whether or not we take a teacher and a preacher, that was not left up to just Umpachini and Konkapat. That was a tribal decision after much discussion. So we have Sargent and Woodbridge, they're working, they're working with the adult population, they are working with the youth population, and those early years in Wahanatuk must have been very interesting, uh, and it must have been uh, very frustrating and yet very rewarding in trying to kind of understand each other. You have the Mahikinatuk who are trying to figure out what these individuals are saying, and you have Sargent and Woodbridge trying to figure out what everybody else is saying and working their way through. And as I said, perhaps the Van Valkenburgs every once in a while being there to, to give a lesson in what's going on. But it must have been very interesting, and it must have been very, very eye-opening for both sets of people because, again, two very different mindsets, two very different backgrounds. So now you have Christianity being introduced into the mix because that is the idea of having the mission uh, be here. So John Sargent has to figure out a way in order to communicate to his new population and to communicate the ideas of Christianity to that new population and, for lack of a better word, not scare them. 
when you're talking about body and blood and you're talking about uh, salvation and you're talking about heaven and you're talking about hell and all of these different things, trying to interpret that into a language that you're just beginning to learn would have been extremely, extremely complicated. There was no dictionary, there's no pile of books like there was today that he could open and say, okay, this is, this is how I'm going to translate everything. It was solely by ear, by rote, by, by going over things, just as much as for uh, any teacher, <laughs> communication between teacher and student uh, is, is always, uh, even now in the 21st century, uh, is, is always a challenge. And so it would have been that much more, again, for Timothy Woodbridge as he's trying to learn another language and then translate that into what he wants to express in English. I guarantee that they're not going through algebra or anything like that to begin with, um, but just the basic understanding of the language. In order to come together, there would have been opportunities for Sargent to bring members of the tribe to various different places. Uh, when he is ordained as a minister for this area, there will be members of the tribe who will be there, and there will be the opportunity at that time for baptism after he is ordained. And he is going to be ordained on Thanksgiving Day. So that makes it that much more of a, an interesting uh, opportunity. And baptism, because again, we're talking about a very, very complicated system, baptism for people is not going to happen immediately. Um, there is still a learning process that's going on. John Conkapot will take the name John. Uh, his wife will take the name Margaret and his daughter Catherine. And that is kind of uh, the first change as they're taking anglicized names to be as their first name, uh, and then keeping a, an indigenous name as their surname. And that is a, a change that is a, the, a process that is going to happen. Uh, Umpachini will take the name Aaron uh, and will go forward at that point. And yet, because this interaction has taken place and because things are growing, there are people who are going to start seeing that there is this area out west and what, are, what do we need to do in that area out west. As I said earlier, uh, Governor Belcher, there was a reason why he asked uh, Umpachini and Konkapat to come to begin with and that was that military alliance to begin with dealing with the, the French and Indian Wars. So what else is going to happen? You have more and more people kind of starting to encroach uh, Westfield, Deerfield, Springfield. They're looking at those mountains and those mountains are not necessarily seeming quite so tall anymore. That there is a, a way to get through to the other side and what lies beyond there. There are no dragons, by the way, even then. And so because of this change and because of ownership and property, we see the beginning of dispossession in terms of tribal land. And it is a process. And in terms of uh, the Massachusetts Bay Colony, it's an, an interesting process because it, it's not as clear cut as, as you would think. One of, the first, one of the first transactions is going to be um, for a plot of land in what, was, what is now Berkshire County. It would have been Hampshire County then. And for that plot of land, the tribe received 460 pounds of, of money, three barrels of cider, and 30 quarts of rum. So that was the price that was paid for 36 square miles of Berkshire County, about 23,000 acres. 460 pounds, 
three barrels of cider, and 30 quarts of rum. That's an interesting way of paying for land. It's an interesting way of paying for that particular size of land. And I can guarantee without any doubt that if you went to any Englishman or Dutchman and said, I'll give you 460 pounds, three barrels of cider, and 30 quarts of rum, that they probably would have laughed. That would not have been an acceptable amount of money for such a, 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 a tract of land at that time. And so it's interesting that that is what is being offered by the provincial government for a plot of land in Berkshire County. It's also interesting that two of the items, the cider and the rum, are being used as ways of payment uh, because this is, does not go over well. Uh, alcohol is not something that interacts with Native Americans very well whether we're talking about the 17th century or whether we're talking about the 21st century. So there's, there is something there, the idea that you know, barrels of cider and quarts of rum, or whether you're talking about glass beads or, or whatever it is, there was not a full disclosure, there was not a, a equal amount given as taken. In, those, in that early time. Stockbridge does not start off as Stockbridge. It starts off as Indian Town. And the idea of creating Indian Town, again, is another kind of look at what is here and what's coming. Indian Town is eventually going to be another 36 square miles. And today, it would encompass what is today Stockbridge and West Stockbridge. And in that, in that size, in that area, um, you have a great deal of resource. You have the water that's going to be a source. But the whole idea behind Indian Town was to consolidate the indigenous population that there would not be a number of different villages or communities that the indigenous population in terms of southern Berkshire County would be condensed into Indian Town. The documentation behind this states that Indian Town is being given to the Mahicanook Indians and that it will be overseen by individuals like John Sargent, Timothy Woodbridge, and others. So isn't it interesting that they will apportion a particular amount of land in order to consolidate the native population off of their own territory and not necessarily give anything in return. The land is theirs, according to this 1735 document. It belongs to the tribe. But doesn't all of the land belong to the tribe? Except for maybe that one section that they already paid for. So they consolidate. Everybody moves into that area of Indian town, and then it moves on 1739, it becomes Stockbridge. Uh, Stockbridge is not a native name. It, it is not Indian town. Uh, it is named for an, another town that exists in, in England. Um, and then we move forward. 1739 is the construction of the first meeting house. There will now be a designated place a building where worship will take place, where town government will take place, where education will take place, that's a change that's different. I will say that part of the interesting experiment that is Stockbridge that begins 
as it's incorporated in 1739, and for about the next 30 years, 25 years, will be that from the very beginning, town fathers were both English and Native American. You do not see that in most instances. In most instances, it is purely European uh, because the Native American, the indigenous, does not understand what's going on. Stockbridge was an interesting experiment that in the beginning, there were both that were involved. It's also, I think, important to point out that both are involved in the church. That John Sargent, as he begins to have a growing English-speaking population, as well as an indigenous population, has gone through his transformation. He has, in some ways, assimilated his understanding of the tribe into himself. He has taken on and has mastered the language. He is probably one of the most learned individual, individuals, aside from Timothy Woodbridge, regarding how the tribe works, the understanding, uh, you know, as well as communication. He is going to spend time working with the children. And so he will preach to the native population in their own language, not in English. He will spend his time preaching to his flock in English, and he will spend time preaching to his other flock in Mexican. And so I think there's a great deal to be said about that relationship between Sargent and Woodbridge and the rest of the, uh, the, rest of the indigenous population. The entire tribe does, is not going to uh, become baptized. There will be a number of different individuals who will stay with the, the, the tribal understanding, the tribal, the tribal religious uh, value. There will be those individuals who will have interactions with Moravians. There's a Moravian community that's not that far from Ankrum, New York. And so there will be that interaction over time. But we see that there is kind of this, this working relationship between those that have arrived and those that were here. Other things will develop. 1745, the tribe receives a two-volume Bible set. It is sent by the Society for the Promulgation of the Gospel in Foreign Parts. It's a two-set, very large tome that is probably by far one of the most prized possessions that the tribe still has today. Uh, the tribe would use that during their religious services. Uh, the conch shell that I blew, that is not the original one, but it is something similar to what would have called people to worship at the, that first meeting house. Uh, there is a picture here of the first communion set that, was, uh, that existed. And the book on the left-hand side here uh, is a registry of baptisms, which include the registry of baptisms of tribal members, of adults, and of children over time up to starting in 1758 and moving on to uh, 1819. So it's, it's interesting that we have you know, this, this record of, of what's transpiring, who, who the children are, who the adults are, and so on. Uh, just a, a quick aside note, that Bible, as I said, is probably one of the most treasured possessions of the tribe, and as they move, that Bible will move with them. Uh, it's not until the 1920s that it will return to Stockbridge. Uh, Miss Mabel Choate, after having moved the mission house from its original location to where it is on Main Street, went to the tribe and asked, paid for, uh, for various different items, that she then put into the mission house. One of the items that was given, that was brought here, was the Bible. Uh, and it's in 1991 that the, the Bible will be repatriated back to the tribe. So they, they have that. And it is 
on display. If you go to Wisconsin, it's at the Arvid Miller Museum, and each day they turn a page so that it, it's permanently on display, and once they go through the first volume, then they go through the second volume. When John Sargent died in 1749, that changed a great deal because one of the key English individuals who was making sure that there was a equilibrium between what was right for the indigenous population and what the European population wanted was gone. Uh, the inscription on his tombstone, his tombstone was the first tombstone placed in the, uh, the old section of the cemetery. If you've not seen it, uh, I encourage you to go see it. Uh, both his and his lovely wife, Abigail, uh, both of their stones were uh, part of the cleaning process that went on. So if you were there and saw it last year, two years ago, uh, it was a very dark, uh, dingy, black colored. Now it's a very different, it's a very vibrant white, back to white color um, for one, and the other one is a, a, almost a, a rose color. Uh, they have, there is talk that the inscription that is on there that describes Sargent uh, is actually something that was written by one of the tribal members at that time. He is not the first person to be buried in the uh, the cemetery. He's just the first one to have a marker because tribal members who were baptized would have been buried in that area, um, which is why today there is a, a stone that was put, one was put up in 1900 uh, that talks about Konkapaw and others, and then recently within the last five years the tribe put another stone in uh, that indicates where two young ladies who were members of the tribe were buried early on. So there's that. But that person was gone. Timothy Woodbridge is the teacher is here, but John Sargent is gone. And I believe that the tribe felt that blow as things moved forward. Our second minister, Reverend Jonathan Edwards, will arrive in 1751 and he will spend his time until he leaves to become the president of the College of New Jersey. His interaction with the tribe is not going to be a negative experience, but it's very different from what is going to happen uh, in terms of the interaction between the tribe and John Sargent, because Edwards, there's a growing European flock. There are more and more families, whether it's the Browns, the, the, the Joneses, the Edwards, the Woodbridges, the Stoddards, the Williamses, those families are becoming to, are coming to this area. We are seeing the change that there are more European style houses that are going to be going up in Stockbridge. And Edwards is more than happy to continue to interact with the tribe, but he's not going to be, he has no desire really to learn the language and, and fully interact, having a, a complete understanding of the language. He will use an interpreter. And they will use that in terms of communication, in terms of preaching to the indigenous population, and so on. Uh, so there is, there's definitely a change in, in what's going on there. His time here is, is relatively short, and as that, has, as that time changes, um, once he is done, then we have Stephen West. And Stephen West and his time here with the tribe uh, is not necessarily the, the best between the two. He is going to be, even though there is a great deal of indication that talks that he is a very kind-hearted, soft-spoken individual, and he is going to be here for 60 years. 60 years. Um, the interaction with the tribe is not going to be at anywhere near as strong uh, because by then the population, the indigenous population has de decreased and the, 
the European population has significantly increased, which is why in the book of baptisms we see a longer list of people that is growing. Uh, thank you. A longer, a longer list of European names that are growing and a shorter, shorter list of individuals who are uh, indigenous. So next major change, 1765, so that is during the, the time of, of West, uh, there is a political change, and it has to do with that land again. 1765, the uh, provincial government uh, okayed the use of land to pay off debts. Before this time period, if you wanted to take land or if you wanted to purchase land from somebody who was within the tribe, you had to write to Boston and ask for permission. You could not just simply hand over a certain amount of money or cider or whatever uh, and then take that land. It needed to be approved. There needed to be an understanding that the individual from the tribe that you were purchasing that land from was okay with the, uh, with the amount that was to be paid and that it was okay with Boston. 1765, that changes. You no longer need that approval. You can simply start taking land or purchasing land or receiving land for debts. So it's an amazing change because all of a sudden there are so many individuals who now have debt. And we see a, a quick change in land ownership from the indigenous people in the town of Stockbridge uh, moving to individuals who are from the European community. Um, Josiah Brown is going to be one individual who's going to be a, a major player in that. Ephraim Williams Sr. is going to be another major person uh, who is going to be part of that. His son Ephraim Jr. is going to be Williams College. So. So there's a very different change in the relationship between the tribe, and this is really the beginning of that downward trajectory in terms of, of what's happening. And yet the tribe stays here because this is their this is their homeland, this is their, you know, this is their sacred property, their sacred territory. And it goes back to that understanding of possession and, and so on. We get into the the time period of the Revolutionary War, and again, there will be a, a number of individuals from the town of Stockbridge who are part of the tribe who will be willing to lay down their life for the colonial cause. They will be at the Battle of Bunker Hill, they will be at Saratoga, they will be at the Battle of Kingsbridge, and at one point, there will be a letter that Hendrik Oppenmott will send to Boston saying, our tribe has given of our men, and now because they are gone, we need something because their wives, their children, and, and so on have no means of income. And so we would like you to compensate their widows and orphans for what they have done for this cause. Um, and sadly, there is no remuneration in terms of that. That is not something that will happen. The war ends, we are now America. General George Washington in 1783, as a thank you to the tribe, sends an ox to Stockbridge, to the tribe, saying thank you very much for your involvement, for everything that you have given. Um, here's an ox, have a roast, throw a party, and so on. And they do, there is a celebration of what has happened. That's the summer. And by the fall, the tribe is gone. There will be 280 individuals who will leave Berkshire County, about 150 of them from Stockbridge, and they will leave Berkshire County, and they will move to Oneida Territory in New York State, having almost no land left here in town. So it's a very quick change 20 years, and dispossession comes through, 
death because of war and so on is going to take place. And it's a very, very sad time uh, in terms of that, that relation. Uh, I will finish up. And I will say that in terms of that, um, the tribe will hold on to a couple of small pieces of land, one of the last pieces of tribal territory that will be handed over to uh, a white settler will be the Indian burial ground. Uh, Dr. Oliver Partridge will be granted that, um, that deed, and that was because through his time here, he was a very close uh, person with the tribe, and so they felt as though they had a friend in Dr. Partridge, and they handed that deed over to him, and then from there, it went to the town, kind of. Um, and that's, that's a whole thing that's, that's currently going on. Um, so that was kind of the end of that dispossession. The Mohican people have their own trail of tears in that because of the policies that are set forward by President Andrew Jackson and then carried out by Martin Van Buren, the tribe will go from New York State eventually into Indiana, Ohio, Indiana, and then make their way to where they are today in Wisconsin. But the last thing that I'll say before I stop is that Stockbridge, the church, the town, has maintained an ongoing relationship with the tribe, which I think is a, a very important thing, uh, which goes towards that land acknowledgement that, that uh, the, the Social Justice Task Force is, is looking to create, uh, because there has been that ongoing relationship. Uh, Reverend John Slingerland, who was a member of the tribe, came here in, 17, in 1879, and there was a dedication of the monument at the Indian burial grounds. He was here for Laurel Hill Day, where he gave a talk. There have been ongoing relationships, um, and so I think it's important to maintain those. So with that, I will stop. Um, there are a number of resources that are available in terms of the early history of Stockbridge, the indigenous history of Stockbridge, and I'd be more than happy to share that at some time. Thank you.